just a little background on Gary is he um, started out in the Presbyterian Church as a pastor for about 20 years. That's where he got a lot of like direct service experience working directly with um, the homeless ministry and some feeding programs at his local church. Because of his experience there, moved on to the Presbyterian Hunger Program. And I'm hoping if you have time, you can share the um, story of the Presbyterian Hunger Program and how advocacy helped that village in Peru. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's, app, it's a great story, and I can never remember the details. Anyways, so we worked at the Hunger Program there for the Presbyterian Church, and then I moved on to work for Bread for the World, where he is currently the Director of Church Relations Department. My old department, he is also, above all, a fantastic boss, and I miss him very, very much. He is, um, and he's also on the board for Food Resource Bank, where he has to travel internationally sometimes to have their board meetings, so that's cool, too. And um, I think I think that coming most of it. He's a grandpa and has a new one on the way. New one here. New one here. Right. New one here. That's exciting. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I'm um, I'm really glad to be here and uh, glad to have the, the chance to to come back to Eastern. I was here a couple of years at the Transformational Development Conference, and that was a, that was a good experience, and uh, seeing the commitment of Eastern to uh, global development and the kind of global development that, that really makes sense in transforming communities. Um, it's also good to come back and see Melissa. Um, Melissa was the assistant of department assistant in our department for a couple of years and um, uh, had the place well organized when she left. It's, they need you back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just, just to, to have some time to, to share with you. I'm, uh, as Melissa said, I am the director of church relations with Bread for the World. Um, Bread is, as we call ourselves, a collective Christian voice urging our nation's decision makers to end hunger at home and abroad. So the, the word voice probably gives you a clue that we are an advocacy organization. Um, we don't do any work on the ground. We do no relief or development work. We are simply advocates with the U.S. Congress on behalf of global development and, actually, and hunger and poverty in the United States as well. Um, and in the church relations department, our major responsibility is to collect that collective Christian voice, uh, to, to find, help find the common voice of uh, a broad collection of the, the U.S. church. We are probably the most broadly ecumenical, to use that term, organization that you will ever experience. Um, because uh, not only do we have strong uh, work with the Roman Catholic Church and the traditional mainline Protestant churches and great participation now with the evangelical churches and some Orthodox churches, um, we also have really worked very hard at outreach to, to African American co uh, congregations and uh, Latino congregations as well. And so Bread for the World, uh, tries very hard to represent the, the whole breadth of the American Christian Church and to collect that voice so that we're able to speak uh, with one strong Christian voice to Congress um, about the things that um, about the things that affect poor and hungry people. Now, in D.C. right now, we would love to be working on foreign assistance reform. Um, that's what our whole work plan, our three-year plan, calls for us to be doing. Uh, that's what uh, our offering of letters for this year, and I'll share that with you in a little bit, calls us to, for us to be doing. Um, and that's what we have developed all of our resources to be doing, is to, is to work on helping refocus U.S. foreign assistance so that it's most effective in, in, in uh, fighting hunger and poverty around the world. But if you spend any time reading the news, or listening to the news, um, you know that there's only one thing that's happening in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, and that is the budget. Um, 
while there's, um, there are many things that need to be happening, uh, nothing is going to happen until there's some agreement on the, the federal budget. The, the, the fiscal year, 2011, started six months ago, and we still do not have a budget for fiscal year 2011. And um, the Congress uses something called continuing resolutions to keep things going. Think of it as a snooze alarm. Um, you know, you kind of, you, you, you wake up and, it, and you're out of the budget's almost over, and instead of getting up and doing something about it, you hit the snooze button, and you can go back to sleep for six months, or th six weeks, or three months, or however long it is, um, well, hopefully something gets done to fix the budget, and then the alarm rings again and you have to do something else. Well, the alarm rings again this Friday. Um, the, the continuing resolution is over this Friday, and if there is no budget agreement or there is no other continuing resolution, the government shuts down. And so, you know, when you, when you listen to the news in D.C. and you've got Thousands and thousands of folks who work for the federal government. You know anybody works for the federal I know government? Yeah. Um, work for the federal government. The question is, will I go to work next month? Um, and if I'm in the middle of a project, what should I do with it? Should I try to hurry up and finish it, or should I let it drop? Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of concern uh, among folks in D.C. right now. But the concern that we have that's pulled us away from our foreign assistance work is that what's being proposed for the 2011 budget will be disastrous for poor and hungry people. Um, the numbers are, 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 are pretty tough if you look at them. Um, they're talking about basically a 2.6% cut in all of federal spending. That's what the House HR1, the, the, the bill that's been passed in the House, calls for. 2.6% of all spending would be cut, but that would include 26% of all U.S. foreign assistance. So 10 to 1 ratio in, in this foreign assistance in terms of the budget cuts. So the specific impacts of those would, would be pretty devastating. It, the, um, FY11 HR1 um, calls for $946.5 million to be cut from U.S. food assistance, U.S. food aid. That's 46% of what we do overseas. That means that 15 million people who, who are depending on us, these are mostly people in situations of drought and, and, and famine, 15 million people would be losing U.S. food assistance um, of the hungriest people in the world. Of, of U.S. development assistance, which is the more long-term assistance, which includes things like ag agricultural development and infrastructure development, there's $746 million that would be cut. That's 30% of the U.S. foreign assistance budget. Um, and we go down the line, there's 10% of what we give to PEPFAR, the President's Emergency uh, Program for AIDS Relief, um, would be cut. Um, that would mean that 33 million people who are receiving HIV counseling and testing, of those probably about 10% of them would fall off the program. And their antiretrovirals would not be available. Um, 29% of the funding to the Millennium Ch uh, Challenge account, which is, a, which is a program to help countries with good governance actually build up their, um, uh, build up their capacity for development. So in all, what we're, what we're looking at in this budget discussion is not simply a, a philosophy of government as, as the news media portray it. It is really a, a, a tremendous cutback of U.S. commitment to do anything about poverty and hunger overseas. Um, and if you look on the domestic side, the, the numbers are just as bad. 
disproportionately the cuts are aimed at programs that impact poor and hungry people. Um, the situation is so bad that um, a number of folks in D.C., uh, leaders of U.S. Uh, Christian advocacy organizations, uh, Jim Wallace from Sojourners, um, David Beckman from Bread for the World, Tony Hall from the Alliance to End Hunger, uh, announced last Monday that they were beginning um, a, a fast, a water-only fast, um, seeking, um, first of all, uh, God's guidance for them in that work. Um, and seeking, um, as to times of prayer and fasting do, some, some change, some repentance within, within the whole society um, and within Congress. Um, and so Tony is beginning his, his second week on that fast right now. And a number of us are, are joining them in one way or another. So I'm, I'm glad to come to lunch with you today, but I'm not eating lunch anymore. So. Um, that's, that, that's my participation in the fast, um, because it gives us a, a chance to focus on prayer and on seeking God's will in this time. And I really, the first thing I want to do with you today is just invite you to figure out how you might join it, how you might be part of this, um, this calling on God. As, as, as David says, you know, our prayer is simple. We invite God to reshape our personal priorities and the priorities of our nation. And we call on God to help us form a circle of protection around programs that are needed by the most vulnerable around us. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, and um, it's not where we would plan to be, and that's not where our work plan calls us for us to be, but it's where we are right now. Um, and this is just the first step in what will be a tremendously long and difficult battle for the next year. Because as soon as we finish fiscal year 2011 budget, we need to start working on the fiscal year 2012 budget. And there's, there's calls for much more, many more drastic cuts on that. And in the meantime, we're going to reach the, the federal debt ceiling limit and if the government cannot borrow anymore, it's the same thing as not having a budget and we need to start shutting down, shutting down the program. And there's also a very long and important process to say how are we going to deal in the long term with the deficits that are plaguing our country. And I, many of you might know Ron Sider's project and Melissa's work on this project of the, the generational justice project which calls for you know, some very serious and deep cuts in how we spend, some, some increases in how we raise revenues as a government, but also uh, makes a strong call for protecting those programs that are most important to vulnerable people. Um, and so, you know, wherever you are in terms of what you're preparing to do with, with, with the degrees that you're earning, the impact of what happens with our federal government and its budgets and how it spends money and does will, will have a tremendous impact on what you are able to do wherever you are. And so I, I really encourage you to, to take that time to, to, to uh, figure it out, to, to gain a perspective on, on federal budgets and, and, and what they mean so that you can be an informed citizen um, in, a, in a debate that's going to be going on for quite a long time. Let me, let me just pause there a minute, see if anyone has any thoughts or comments on the budget and the budget crisis. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. But All right. Probably what the opponents are saying is that, and what we learned here, is that a lot of U.S. international aid is poorly spent. Um, so these cuts could just be a matter of cutting out some of the fluff. And if we really focus, you could do the same amount of good with one with only two thirds of the money. What what would your response be to that? Well, actually, you know, our our own agenda is a reform agenda, and 
I'll, I'll get to that a little more. I'll get to that more lately. But basically, we agree that U.S. U.S. foreign assistance could be much better spent. Um, it should be focused on um, on development that's closer to the grassroots. It should be focused on development uh, more on ag development. It should be focused more on women's uh, women's development. It, it needs to have much more of a of a uh, country focused orientation uh, so that it's really owned by the, by the people themselves. Um, all of that is true. Um, and there's also been waste within, so there needs to be much more accountability and transparency in how we do it. Um, all, all of that is true to, to some extent. Um, but, but our argument is if the problem is that it's inefficient and that it's wrongly directed, then let's fix it. You know, let, let's make it right. There, there are ways to make it right, and there's a tremendous movement within Congress, the actually in both parties, and in ways to make U.S. foreign assistance much better. Um, the argument that's being made, um, at least the, the, the actually presenting argument, has nothing to do with waste or inefficiency. It really is a response to the fact that when you ask Americans um, what should we cut in the budget, over 46% 40, of Americans say cut U.S. foreign assistance. And over 50% over of evangelicals say cut U.S. foreign assistance. And so it's an easy political move to do unless we mobilize folks to say, hey, this is not who we are as a country. Um, and this, and to, to dissuade them from ideas that if you ask the average American, how much do you think goes to U.S. foreign assistance? What percentage of the budget? The answer is anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. If you ask them how much they think should go to the budget, it's generally between 5 and 10 percent. And when you tell them that the, the amount of U.S. foreign assistance, the U.S. budget that goes to poverty-focused development is 0.6 percent of the budget, no one knows that. And because they don't know that, they're all very susceptible to arguments that say, we need to just cut. Um, I'm curious um, how the rest of the budget is being affected by these cuts. Is foreign, uh, foreign aid being in the front forms of the cuts, or is it a general overhaul? This first, you know, the FY uh, 2011, the HR1 bill, cut. $60 billion, um, and it, it cut it uh, across the board to some extent, except it left military completely untouched. Um, and it left, it did nothing with revenue. So when, when you look at, um, when you look at budget government expenses, there, there are two kinds of expenses. There is the expenses where you write a check to pay for something. And then there are what we call revenue expenses, the monies that we give back to people in tax credits. And um, the, the um, HR1 did nothing with revenue expenses so, and, and, so, and did nothing with all of the tax cuts that were passed last year for the high income folks. And, and it took fairly much across the board cuts um, but it but it focused disproportionately on programs before the and there's some philosophical pieces that that, that are yeah um, given this kind of the understanding of cuts and the understanding of where the American population thinks about that how well I might agree and I might agree that defense needs to be tightening their belt as much as every other program. We still have to deal with deficit issues, we still have to deal with fiscal responsibility. But you also have to deal with, again, popular opinion. Like last November, there was a Gallup poll that suggested that 49% like, of the United States population felt like our, our military, our defense was just right. But if the 51% thought that we needed to be stronger than what it is today. So while you have that idea of people 
who think that we spend more than we actually do in foreign assistance, but you also have the people that think that we're not actually bulked up enough in our defense. How do you reform that mentality? Well, most, that's part of yeah, that. most U.S. public opinion is bought. Um, it, it bought by highly efficient um, uh, machines that are out there to shape U.S. public opinion. Um, and um, the the U.S. defense contracting industry is probably best at doing it. Um, and the, the jobs they create are, are really good jobs. And so the, the ability to, to kind of shape that public opinion is, is pretty easy. In fact, just like the ability to shape legislation is, um, is slanted towards people of wealth and, and corporations of wealth because of the ability to lobby. So there are, the, the U.S. banking industry, for example, has five lobbyists for every member of Congress. Um, the insurance industry has two lobbyists for every member of Congress. Um, so you can pretty much do a, 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 a you know, you think of basketball and you put five people on one, uh, you can you can be pretty good at it. Um, so and and U.S. poverty groups have folks like Bread for the World, <laughs> with uh, you know a couple a couple of few lobbyists and a little bit of money, um, and so the so the the shaping of opinion in Congress and the shaping of U.S. popular opinion uh, really reflects you know, where the money is, um, and. So an organization like Bread, our, our, we see ourselves as the, as the David against the Goliath of those who shape public, public opinion, um, trying to help people find at the roots of their own faith um, a, new, a different perspective on how they look at the priorities of their government. Uh, um, and 
So that's how we we move move into Congress. So the we have had meetings face to face with members and staff of now about 65 percent of the new members, the new class members of uh, that came in. This brand new class, uh, a lot of them um, Tea Party folks. Um, we, we have been in talking face to face about the issues. Most of the Tea Party folks, most of the new members of Congress, never had to think on the uh, on their election campaign about foreign assistance at all. No one asked them about it. No one asked. It wasn't it wasn't anywhere anywhere on their on, on their radar screen. And now they come into Congress and they've got to have a position on it. And so one of the one of the advantages is to be there and, and to say, I am with you member constituents from, from your district and we can help you think this through. Um, they're also not the, that new group is not not as um, consistent as you might think in, in, in their thinking about these issues um, because many of them are church folks uh, many of them have people in their families who have been missionaries or on short-term mission trips um, and so they're receptive to, to, to arguments about about the importance of of growing and development work. Um, but it is, it's an it's a office by office, kind of visit by visit uh, task, and, and that's the process we're involved in. Now. Good. So, you know, kind of point number one is, is I, I invite you to the fast, um, to pray. Um, to let folks know what you're doing and why, um, and to let your member of Congress know uh, what, you, what you're thinking. And you may agree with us or not. I, I still think it's critical that you let your member of Congress know what you're thinking. Um, so that, that said, let me, let me um, do a little bit of introduction to Bread for the World. Um, as I said, we are a collective Christian voice. Uh, urging our nation's decision makers to end hunger in the home of the world. Um, and we've been doing this for 38 years. Um, we have about 75,000 individuals or, who are dues paying members of, of, of Bread for the World. And we have about 5,000 congregations spread around the country that uh, are engaged with us in some way in a given year. And about 500 of those 5,000 are what we call covenant churches, um, who uh, make a commitment to be engaged on hunger and poverty issues in their community year-round, to do an annual, what we call, offering of letters to Congress, uh, and to support bread in, in its work, and to, to be at prayer for both our, our work and for those who we work with. Um, and we're organized um, to, to work along with um, the, the, the structures of the church. Um, so in my department, uh, not only do we work with those 5,000 congregations, um, but we work with about 50 national Christian denominations and agencies. Um, so that we, we coordinate, our, coordinate our work with them and they see what we do as an expression of their work. As Melissa said, I came to the Bread for the World from the Presbyterian Church, where for a number of years I was the, the head of the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and then was responsible for the, the relief and development work, all the relief and development work of, of, of the church. Um, and as such, I saw Bread for the World as an extension of that work. Um, I think what Melissa was asking me to say, and I'm not sure, but you know, it's, it's how we uh, how we saw the the the, the breakdown of, of you know, how the church responds to hunger, and it's, and for you folks, it's probably you know um, pretty obvious, but for folks in the pews, it's not always obvious. So so we understood that, that there were really five ways that the, the church responds to hunger. Um, 
The first is by direct hunger relief. It is getting food to people when food is what, is what they need. And sometimes, the best way to deal with hunger is food. Not always. Sometimes the best way to deal with hunger is food. The, the, the problem with direct food relief is you, you work and work and work and work, and tomorrow folks are hungry again. Um, on the domestic side of the issue, domestic side, you know, there's there's tremendous amount of work that's done in churches in collecting food and sharing food and food pantries and soup kitchens. Um, but every morning, once once you're done with that work, you start all over again. Because you've really not changed any situation. You're simply servicing the problem of hunger. Not, not solving it. Um, there is development assistance, and there are people, no development, but you know, the development assistance in, in terms of hunger is helping individuals and families and communities so that they become capable of, of having and are able to have the resources they need to feed themselves. Um, development assistance is a long is long term work, um, but it can have a, a permanent effect. But there are three other things that the church does as well. One is something we call lifestyle integrity. It's that thing kind of wrapped up in, um, in, um, in being careful what we eat so that others may eat. Um, it, is, it, it relates to caring for the earth, caring for, um, um, caring for our neighbors, um, looking at what we consume and how we consume it, buying fair trade products, all, all of the things that, that allow us to, to, to change the world through the way that we participate in it, in a way that makes it more possible for folks to eat. Um, the fourth is something we call hunger education. And it's the, that broad task of helping people know what reality is. Um, most people have very, very poor conception of what the reality, what reality is in terms of hunger and poverty in the world. Um, so, for example, right now, the, the official estimate is that 925 million people in the world do not have sufficient food to live a minimally productive life. They do not have enough calorie in, in intake uh, to do that. Um, now, there's, there's, there's good news and there's bad news in that number. The good news is that proportionate to population, that, that, that has come down in the last several decades uh, from if you go all the way back to the 60s, from almost 30% of the world's population down to about 15% of the world's population. Um, so, you know, many folks, and I am the president of Bread for the World, David Beckman, just wrote a book called Exodus from Hunger that, that really says we have missed a great exodus, a great time of deliverance. Uh, we haven't been paying attention to it. That God, and this, this has got to be God's work. You know, God hears all of these prayers of mothers who can't feed their children. You know, you know imagine being God. Millions of people, 925 million people, praying every day just for food. So that if there is a, if there is a movement to, re, to reduce, that reduces the number of hungry people in the world, don't we think that God must have something to do with that? That, that, that God is answering prayers? Um, and so we talk about this exodus from hunger. Um, and you can, you can track over time um, the... The, the, the decrease in those numbers, particularly in the percentages. On the other hand, there's bad news in that 925 million. 
Not only, not only because it's not going to complete that many people, because, but because two years ago, or three years ago, it was 850 million. Okay. Um, and the, the food price spikes of 19, 2009 and 2010 have thrown 75 more million people into that category. Nobody in America knows that. You know, if, if you would stop a stop hundred people on the street and ask them that quest the question, you would not find one who had any, any idea. Because it's outside of the consciousness of the American people. And the only place people are going to learn about that is in church. Um, and so our, our job is hunger education. And then the fifth, the fifth category is what we call public policy advocacy. It really is how do we change the policies of our nation in such a way that what our country does as a player in the world does the most good and the least bad. Now, That's the next thing. Um, so those are the five things. Direct food relief, development assistance, lifestyle, education, and advocacy. And, and Bread for the World does education and advocacy. I want to give you a sense of, uh, of, of how we do it. Uh, every year, as I said, we do a, uh, an offering of letters. Several thousand churches who are willing to, to organize their uh, members to write letters to Congress on one particular topic. Uh, we generate hundreds of thousands of letters to Congress. And it is what opens the doors in terms of changing legislation. Um, and this year's offering of letters focuses on uh, reforming U.S. foreign assistance. Remember, this is not this is not a, uh, a graduate level uh, presentation. This is a presentation for local congregations on the issues that we're dealing with. We are moved by God's grace in Jesus Christ to help our neighbors. We have to really see everyone as our sister, our brother. As Christians, that's our goal that we do other things and do good things for the benefit of everybody else. This year, Bread for the World's offering of letters is giving Americans the chance to make a real difference for hungry and poor people by handwriting letters asking Congress to make U.S. foreign assistance more effective. The Foreign Assistance Act, which governs U.S. foreign aid, was written back in 1961. It needs to be updated for the 21st century. Bread for the World's 2011 Offering of Letters urges Congress and the President to work together to make U.S. foreign aid more effective in reducing poverty. We need a stronger U.S. government focus on reducing poverty, clearer accountability for how U.S. foreign assistance dollars are spent and the results, a transformed U.S. development agency, and U.S. foreign assistance that meets the needs and wants of local people. U.S. foreign assistance is crucial to countries like Liberia, where two successive civil wars have pushed its people even more deeply into poverty. Imagine a country that for the last two decades has been disrupted by war, coups, and different kinds of upheaval. This is where the help we get from U.S. foreign aid goes a long way. With the help of U.S. foreign assistance, Liberian cocoa farmer David Capon is making great strides to lead his family out of poverty after years of civil war. We're only concerned about our life, our survival. So the hope is we're born and became a big bush. David's cocoa farm is up and running again, and he's doing better than ever. Thanks to special training from ACDI VOCA, an organization partly funded by U.S. foreign assistance. I'm able to produce good quality and to get good price. I get better price than all the farmers, to be frank. We go and prepare good cocoa and therefore I get good price for it. Today, there's a global demand for the high-grade cocoa beans needed to make chocolate. 
Liberia isn't among the world's top five cocoa producers yet, but it has potential if it improves the quality of its cocoa beans. So David learned state-of-the-art harvesting, fermenting, and drying techniques to enhance his cocoa. Fermentation is important because that will give flavor to uh, the cocoa. The organization also helped David and other cocoa growers form a farmer's association, which means they can negotiate better prices for their beans. First in the history of my cocoa production, I was able to get $2 per kilogram last year. So for that reason, the little money I got, I was able to, to buy a motorbike. It might seem like a frivolous purchase, but owning a motorbike saves David the high cost of hiring a car to take his cocoa to the warehouse. U.S. Foreign Assistance also funded the training David received to run his farm as a business. Now he keeps detailed records so he can measure his progress each year. That's how he knows he's more than doubled his income. But for David, there's only one real measure of his family's progress. He can now pay for all of his school-aged children to attend school. Where do you get that from? Where do you get that from? Education is especially important to David since he's also a teacher and principal of the local school. But now he makes less teaching than he does farming. How well I'm good, number one, my children are now hungry, number two, they, they are going to school, and number three at least, I'm able to clothe them without seeing them but again. Effective U.S. foreign assistance helps families like David's become self-sufficient, no longer just surviving, but prospering. U.S. foreign assistance could benefit millions more people if it's better coordinated. Today, U.S. foreign assistance is scattered over 12 departments, 25 different agencies, and nearly 60 government offices, leading to one big tangle of inefficiency. Too often, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. At a time like this, we need to make the best possible use of our tax dollars in response to the needs of poor and hungry people. We need better coordination, more flexibility, greater accountability, and closer partnerships with local non-governmental organizations, known as NGOs, to get help to the people who need it most. And nowhere is help needed as urgently as in Haiti, where emergency relief for last year's earthquake is now shifting toward reconstruction. There are similarities between Haiti and Liberia. We had, both countries had a string of uh, unsuccessful governments. Both countries were hit by devastating events in Haiti, an earthquake in Liberia, a war. It is in this instance that foreign aid can actually help to make the country better. Last year's earthquake badly damaged Haiti's banking system. Falcoze is Haiti's alternative bank for the poor. It's an NGO that's giving poor Haitians access to credit and protecting their meager savings. With U.S. foreign assistance and support from U.S. churches, Falcoze has provided small loans to more than 45,000 of the country's poorest women, women like Rosamund Charles. They use the money mostly to start businesses, so they can become self-reliant and lift their families out of poverty. NGOs like Falcoze also provide needed services when the government isn't able to. It's a model the Haitian government could follow as it rebuilds the country. Voila! Falcoze offers nutrition screening, health education, and literacy classes to help their borrowers succeed. <laughs> Writing is something most of us take for granted, but the letter you write to Congress today can win lasting changes for millions of people like Rosamond and David. Grassroots advocacy for a Christian should be like breathing. The all faith letters combines the power of the pen and the power of prayer, and Congress really does pay attention. A simple handwritten letter can literally change somebody's life. <laughs> Oh, my I want them to all be educated, and uh, when I'm old, they'll be able to take care of me and some to uh, take care of my family. Yeah! Haiti and Liberia.
Liberia, like many developing countries, have great potential for progress right now. But how far each can go will depend largely on how we can make U.S. foreign assistance more effective, more accountable, more responsive to the needs of local people, and more focused on reducing hunger and poverty. So this is our, um, our way of working uh, with, with congregations and a way of pulling together the power of that, that voice to actually change things. Um, well, let me stop and see if anybody has any comments or thoughts about that. Yeah. With, uh, as you mentioned, the, the cost of food going up around the world and there's been strikes and, and the riots and things like that. Has the U.S. government looked into the causes behind that and, and seen any culpability on our part? Well, the, the, the cost, there, there are legitimate market forces that, that have driven up, driven up the cost. Uh, part of it is the, the success of, uh, of uh, particularly in, in China and India, of a, a growing uh, middle class that has consumption desires and, and the more consumption there is, the, the more pre the upward pressure there is on prices. And so that's been, a, that's been a, an issue. Um, on the other hand, um, there, there is the question of speculation um, where uh, by buying futures folks speculate on the on the price of um, commodities, and, and that drives the, the, those costs up. And so m some market regulation is, is really important. Um, and then the, the, the third part, which, which becomes really um, controversial, are the actions that governments take um, to protect what they feel to protect internal consumption. So they're, putting export bans on food or, um, and generally th th those, those defensive actions generally turned out to have negative impact because they, they end up even increasing the, the shortages and demand on the, where the market is free and, and pushing the, the prices up even more. Um, but, you know, the, one of the arguments, when we talk about a reformed U.S. foreign assistance and a reformed U.S. US development agency, USAID, part of it is we, our, our development policy for years pushed countries away from thinking about agricultural self-sustainability and pushed people into a, in, into a global market. We argued USAID policy, for example, in Haiti was to say that Haitians, should, Haitians could never grow rice at a competitive price, so Haiti there should, therefore shouldn't be growing rice. We should, Haitians should be factory workers because they're, 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 their labor is competitive. And so over a period of decades, Haiti went from becoming self-sufficient in, in, in rice production to being a, a mass importer of rice. Now that's fine as long as the, the prices are stable and all, but when you get in a global, a, a global situation where, the, where the, the prices spike, uh, you have far less control over, over the, the prices to, to, for people in your, your own country. And, um, and that's another contributing factor. So um, while the issue of food production not simple. In most cases, the, the ability to have um, a good deal of your food production in smallholder farming that really works at a sus subsistence level um, makes it a lot better to, to weather these kinds of, these kind of situations. Any other thoughts? As, so, you know, you, you heard what it is that we're working for in terms of 
foreign assistance reform. It is U.S. foreign assistance that's primarily focused on poverty. Um, and that's not, you, you may think that that's what it is, but it's not, because the 1961 law upon which all of our foreign assistance was built was, what was happening in 1961? Cold War. Cold War. This, uh, our foreign, all of our foreign assistance is built on the foundation of a program with a Cold War mentality. And, and the, the primary goal of foreign assistance at that point was to win friends for the U.S. in a bipolar world. You know, it was to get people on the side of the uh, West instead of the, the, the East. Um, and, and all of the mechanisms of foreign assistance, therefore, played into that kind of reason. Um, so to rewrite U.S. foreign assistance policy and say that the primary focus of U.S. foreign assistance policy should be poverty reduction may seem in, completely intuitive, but it, it's, it will be a complete change in the way things are. Um, secondly, we're looking for transparency and accountability um, to be able to, to respond to the folks who say, you know, it, it's all going for naught anyway. Um, and the transparency and accountability is not only for the sake of the U.S. taxpayer, so that the U.S. taxpayer knows where the money's going. It is for the sake of the people on the ground in the country receiving the money, so they know what money their country's country has received and can hold their own governments accountable for it. Um, ma a, major, a major piece. Um, the, the, the other thing we're looking for as a primary piece is to talk about country-owned solutions or country-owned development strategies. Um, in, the, in the U.S. policy right now, when the, when the funding is being put together, funding is allocated basically by what we call sector. Right? Sector of terminology around here. So, um, sec so that you, know, you have money for primary education, you have money for agricultural development, you've got money for HIV AIDS, you've got money for primary health, um, you've got money for infrastructure. Um, and all those are budgeted into separate accounts. And then everything is organized around those sectoral accounts. And when we go into a, when we're working in a particular country, we may have folks from five or six agencies administering programs from five or six different accounts with five or six different sets of definitions, five or six sets of accountability, um, five or six different sets of reporting forms um, that in that country need, need, need to be used. Our, our goal is to turn, turn the budget on its side and say that what we need to be doing instead is to budgeting being budgeted on a country basis. So there is, um, according to our best estimates, a pool, of, a pool of funds that is available for a country, and the country, by consultation with grassroots and uh, civil society, uh, determines where its priorities are. And then with negotiation with, you know, always negotiation, uh, a, a plan is formed. Um, this, is the, this is the tack that is being taken in the administration's new global food security program which is called Feed the Future and it's a it's a country owned strategy uh, developed in consultation with, with civil society. So we're arguing that that we need less sectoral funding and more country owned or country directed directed funding. And we think it'll make it make a tremendous difference. Um, those are the and a reformed US Foreign Assistance Agency, or Reform USAID. If, if I ask you, just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down on USAID. Let me, let me see what it gives. <laughs> you get a lot of sideways. Huh? 
Yeah, and I, I think that's where the, where the whole country is. Um, there, there's a generation of folks, both in the United States and around the world, who would give you a, a very strong thumbs down. Um, um, and, and with great suspicion. Um, and then there is the issue of capacity of US, USAID, um, that the number of, number of experts have just dwindled down to nothing. When President Obama came in, there was one, one engineer employed by USAID. One person with an engineer. Um, you know, everybody was administering grant applications, but there was there was no sense of uh, no sense of capacity. Um, and so we're looking for a rebuilt USAID that has the capacity to understand the development and really administer it, but a reformed one as well, one that stands where development stands on its own as a guiding principle, and development is not used as a tool of defense on its own. And that's, that's an important consideration. So, how many of you ever written a letter to your member of Congress? Wow. I am impressed. How many of you ever written a letter to your member of Congress about global development? Good. How many of you would like to take one of my offering of letters kits back to your local congregation and doing an offer of letters on the <laughs> I've, I've got a stack of them here, and, I, and I'll be glad to, to uh, for you to take them. It really is, it is a, it's kind of a fun challenge to or, educate and organize a church to write letters to come on some of these issues. And we ask people to write handwritten letters. Why? Yeah. Because they are more effective in person. They are more effective, and they are more time consuming on the other end. Um, if, I, if I'm working in a member of Congress's office and I get 500 form letters, each was, it's a matter of stacking them up, counting them, if I get 500 handwritten letters, I have got to read every one of them. Um, and we're told by folks who work, work on the Hill and doing this kind of work, if a member of Congress gets as few as 10 personal communications, not an email quick or, a, or a, the 10 personal communications on an issue, they will assign a staff person to staff that particular issue. And then once you get a staff person staffing that issue, you've got somebody for a lobbyist to talk to uh, who needs some help. And so it, it works just like that. It is get, getting members of churches to write letters, having people at their door to represent those letters and to start move, moving that agenda through Congress. I want to do one more thing with you. Um, <coughs> Melissa remembers these. Um, last year, um, we, we did a, a, a conference, a consultation at Wheaton College um, called Government, global poverty, and God's mission in the world. Um, very, you know, for me, um, I think one of the most meaningful things that I, I, I participated in, in in this kind of work. The the assumption was that evangelicals, in particular, have have not been engaged in advocacy on global poverty and global development issues. Mainly because there has been within the evangelical church a sense of, of a limited government approach. There's just not been kind of engagement in that advocacy. But in the 1990s, I mean the 1990s, in the 2000s, in, in the, what do we call that thing? The odds. The aughts, back in the aughts, um, there, um, there was tremendous engagement by the evangelical church on pet folk. It really was the, it was the, the first and the strongest kind of, uh, that kind of strong engagement in both the legislation to support PEPFAR 
and consistently in funding for Temple. So that the, the church really believed in the, in the response to, to AIDS and, and got behind it in um, But there was also a sense that many, many church leaders got out there in the advocacy farther than they ever got before, and they looked down and they found themselves standing on some theological thin ice. They, they really had not done the biblical and theological work that justified their, their, their engagement. Um, and so there was a sense of, whoops, what are we doing out here? Um, and so one of the goals of our consultation last year with, with Wheaton College and Micah Challenge um, and Bread for the World Institute was to call together a hundred evangelical leaders from churches, mission agencies, relief and development organizations, media, and, and say, how do we begin to think about the role of government in God's mission in the world? And how do we begin to biblically and theologically provide a grounding for that work? And um, as I say, that was that was the work of the con that conference. And I want to give you each... Um, so rather than me taking you through this, I'd be interested to hear from you. Um, if you were looking for kind of biblical precedence, biblical grounding, for the role of the U.S. government, or for the role of any government in responding to poverty um, outside of its own bounds. Where would you turn in Scripture? What, what is it, you know, what is it that, that gives us a, a kind of a biblical mandate to do what bread for the world does? Yeah. Well, one example, I don't like this out of the bounds, but Moses advocated for the Israelites before Pharaoh. That's right. That's right. My boss likes to say when you know when God decided to, to, to deliver the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. He sent Moses to Pharaoh, and he didn't send Moses to ask permission for holding a bake sale or a canned good collection to, to help the, the hungry Israel. He, he sent Moses to Pharaoh in an advocacy, advocacy role to say, free my people, let my people go. And so one of the, one of the assumptions is, is the God that heard the moans and cries of the people of Israel in Egypt is also the same God who hears the moans and cries of people who are held captive to poverty around the world. God's hearing is not that selective for the, for, for the Israelites. God, God hears and responds. What else, what other scripture would you do? Yeah. Christ is our advocate. Yeah. You want to see for the Father on our behalf. Yes, yeah, so there, there's the example of the inter interceding of Christ on our behalf. And, and when Jesus promised to, promises to call, to send the Spirit to the disciples, at least in, in John's Gospel, he calls that the Holy Spirit. Perfect. Yeah, which is the advocate. Um, so there is this, this sense of advocating. But when you think about where in Scripture is there some precedent of God using one nation to deliver another? Where do you go? Let me ask you another question. Who is it that Isaiah identified as God's Messiah?
Cyrus. Cyrus. Um, strange. Um, Cyrus, the powerful empire. Um, but Cyrus, the one sent by God, used by God, to deliver God's people from, from the Babylonian captivity. Um, and Cyrus, the one who provided for Nehemiah the resources needed to rebuild Jerusalem. Um, so when we when we started doing this this paper, we we asked David Gushy, who's a, a Christian ethicist who um, works on a, a variety of issues, to help us think this through and. And David wrote, a, wrote us a really helpful paper uh, focusing on, on um, Cyrus, but also calling, a, a number, calling us to a number of other texts. Um, and out of that came, comes this statement that, that really becomes a, a, a groundwork for evangelical churches in trying to understand the, the grounding that, that they have for working on... Um, uh, advocacy around the government's role in, in global poverty. Um, and in it you'll find references to Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is a coronation psalm where the, where the, where the king is being prayed for. One of the things that the king that, that is being prayed for is that the goodness of, of the king, Solomon, would be felt not only in his own country, but by countries all around him. Um, you also find, you know, um, a number of judgments uh, against countries whose foreign policy was disastrous to countries around them. And if those fit for, for um, Israel's neighbors, they fit for, for our nations as well. So I, I give you this because I think you will probably at some point need to come to, to terms with you know what is the what's the basis by which you you kind of go out on that on that thin ice and raise your voice as, as a Christian on behalf of poor people uh, and what your government might do. I'm going to stop there and see if you got any questions or things you'd like to talk about. I've got lots of resources for you. We do a hunger report every year um, where, we, where we research the issues. Feel free to pick up a summary from that. Um, and um, the hung, the author of letters if you really think you might head off to get your, your congregation involved. Yeah. Um, I have a more of a personal question for you, Gary. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's also one that I think because of that it's the most interesting to me because it's that I struggle with in this mm -hmm. conversation the most, and that's, um, like, I, I think we represent a very small minority of, of people who are concerned about these issues, and, well, maybe that's kind of true, but mm -hmm. I think what I'm, what I'm getting at is I, I feel like your job is maybe one of the most discouraging jobs a Christian can have, and I'm wondering how you combat cynicism in in your role as this voice mm -hmm. in, a, in a government that mostly doesn't really want to listen and doesn't really want to hear the things that you have to say. Well, I think, I mean, that's really very interesting. Uh, this is, um, this is for me probably my last job. You know, I've been, I've been doing this for, for a while. I'm a couple of years from retirement. Um, and I, I would have to say, personally, it is also the most rewarding. Um, because while there's a lot of you know you're, you're swimming against uh, against the stream, um, there are a lot of folks who don't care about what you're talking about. Um, there are a lot of people that do, um, and it is it is amazing when you find someone who who because of their faith, because of who they believe God to be, and who they believe Jesus Christ to be. Um, kind of turn that corner and, and really become advocates. Um, and interestingly enough, those folks do have impact. 
Um, you know, and, and, and you see it. You see the, the vote of the person who you would never expect to vote for a bill vote for. Because they, they, were, um, they were convinced by a member, one of their constituents that this is important. Um, you know, many of us kind of live off of the, of the, 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 the debt forgiveness movement that was around Jubilee 2000, back in 1999 and 2000. Um, that, that movement was tremendously big, but it was going nowhere in Congress until two members of a church in Birmingham, Alabama, came to, their, came to Washington and sat down with their congressman, caucus, who was the chief, Republican chairman of the, the, the banking committee and had no idea what they were talking about. He thought they were coming to talk about credit card debt. Um, and, you know, they started talking about to him uh, as, as, as mothers, um, who were concerned about children, and, and they understood that the mothers in, in countries that were burdened by debt couldn't care, care for their kids, and they spoke about themselves as Christians, and that, that they could not let this die, and Congressman Bacchus, against all of his political instincts, um, said, I'm going to champion this issue. And actually, was the Republican who introduced the bill that finally passed, that that led to tremendous debt work. Um, and you know, out of that movement, there are now 70 million more kids in school in Africa than there were 10 years ago, mostly because of debt work. Um, and so you see, you know, there, there are these there are these ways that 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 you have an impact. Um, I'm also, you know, I think we're we're all up, held up and supported supported by prayer. We, we really are a, we're, we're a faith organization. Um, my, my department, Melissa will tell you, is really very interesting because of the breadth. So on, on my, I'm a Presbyterian minister. On my staff, I have a, a, a Franciscan nun and an African-American Pentecostal bishop. Um, uh, plus um, uh, uh, seminary trained Episcop uh, Episcopalian uh, a UCC minister. Um, it's a it, it, it's a wonderful mix of, of Christian fellowship and a wonderful sense of, of prayer and support. Um, do you really believe that this this is God's call? And if you believe this is God's call, then the immediate results are really quite as important. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I'll try my best. Uh, if it's apparent that we're living in an America where people are concerned about the budget, um, and if it would be politically unwise for politicians to not support cutting budget items, uh, isn't this, wouldn't it be strategically wiser to now use this as an opportunity to argue for reform? Not so much to maintain the level of spending, but to better use the spending. So, to maintain the same level of impact, but use the money smarter, as a way that they can then cut, use less funding in the budget for better reform that will then have better impact long term. Does that, does that make sense at all? Sure, it makes sense. Okay. And, and I actually, I actually think at some point we will probably end up having to do that. Okay. Um, I mean, the argument, however, is that our our current contribution is much smaller yeah. than it needs to be anyway. Um, you know, the, the UN, in adopting the Millennium Challenge, Millennium uh, Development, Development Goals, thank you, um, you know, said that in order to meet it, countries would need, developed countries would need to commit 0.07% of your gross domestic product um, to, 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 to poverty elimination overseas. And the U.S. is still hovering about 1.01 percent. So um, I don't think any of us really are, are ready, you know, to, to drop back and say, "Oh yeah, we, we have." You know, our impact has been good so far, and if we have to do it with less money, we can still do it. On the other hand, you know, when we get down to down to realities, and politics always gets down to the art of compromise, and we start compromising, 
we may be able to use reduced levels of funding as an argument to push forward our, our, our uh, reform agenda. Yeah. Um, is there, are there any examples where your guys reform idea in terms of like the USAID restructuring mm -hmm. to a country-based um, model, were that successful? Because personally, I'm a skeptic. I don't really trust our government that much, much less. Like, for example, I lived in Ivory Coast for a summer, and their government the basket case. Right. Um, the best example is something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the Millennium Challenge Account. Um, this was, um, this was, in addition to KEPFAR, this was President Bush's major contribution. And, you know, George W., I don't know how much to think of him, but as far as U.S. foreign assistance, he was pretty good. Um, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which was outside of USAID, but, but made covenants with countries based on, first of all, evidence of good government and, and, and accountability, and secondly, on, on um, development plans that came out of consultation with civil society and um, and, and more grassroots. And the, if you take a look at the results of those covenants, um, generally, not 100%, not but generally they're much more effective, efficient, and, uh, and um, sustainable. And so I think that, that experience is one of the things that has, that, that's convinced us this, that this is the dimension. So how, do you, how does that couple with your, you mentioned that you guys really are like focused on grassroots. Mm -hmm. I would say government level investment in grassroots are not the same. Well, I mean there's, philosophically there's a couple things going on here. One is church development, I, I love church development, I ran a church development program. And it's very, it was very grassroots folks. Um, and we looked at programs at the village level. Know, basically, and, and and you can do much, you can do good development when you look at, look at the goals of because you can look at the assets of that, the, you know, you can do an asset-based development model, you, you can do all sorts of things. But in reality, a thousand scattered village grassroots programs does not make for a country development model. You know, it, 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 and it, it is not, it's, it's generally not very rational either. It's all kind of who, we, who do we know, whatever. It's only a country government that has the capacity to really do a countrywide development model. And so while, while our own church related development agencies are not engaging with, with country governments, um, it is essential that we have a, a U.S. development agency that is dealing with country governments. Because it's the only way, you know, finally you get a, you get a country countrywide program, um, but you have to focus on accountability and you have to focus on, on consultation. Um, and so part of the MCA um, program and now part of the Feed the Future um, program is a strong emphasis on consultation at, at, at the civil society. We're not down to the village level yet, but we are down to the um, we're down to a much level lower, a lower level of civil society than, than what has been in, in the past. The, the worst of U.S. development assistance really was only talking to government officials about pet projects of, uh, of, the, of the current rulers. And we're far away, far from there. Sure, I mean, Anyone else? Uh, cause we, we've been studying kind of like the pros and cons of um, foreign aid and kind of um, read like Jeffrey Sachs and then um, Easterly. Mm -hmm. um, and, Easterly yeah. yeah, and just kind of like um, pros and cons. And I don't know if you could touch on like what your personal opinion is on um, foreign aid and like the fear of creating dependency and just all the other major effects. It. My friend, Denise Moyo has a very good conversation. Yeah. 
I mean, there is there is always the possibility of dependency. It is, um, and I think you, you know, good development designs around that. Um, good development systems. But I, but I, and my, my sense is, and I think this may not be fair, is that most folks argue against development on the basis of dependency and real, that, that's really a strong argument. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of my, my, my personal, I, I think there's just as much, there's just as much potential for creating dependency in church relief in the as there is in government. And maybe more uh, because of the because of the uh, sometimes the, the, the sense of um, uh, sense by with which we we, we end the process. And so while you know while you've got to constantly be on, on guard, um, you know. And so and I, I I feel. I'm with um, doing helping her folks. You know, I mean, you, you know, you, you've got to understand all your own motivations in development. You've got to understand the, the impact of, uh, of what you're doing. Um, none of that is arguing argument against doing. Gary, what would it take for this to actually be effective, in other words, for this reform? What, what would have to happen, and what role would the for-profit document contractors play if, in fact, this were to happen? Well, let me ask the second part first. But both the for-profit development contractors and, to some extent, the Christian NGOs have some suspicion of moving to a country, country-led development model. Uh, because if you're a sectoral player, and lots of them are, yeah, um, I was at the, at the Airdo, now a core um, you know, yeah, many, many members of the Accord work in a, a particular sector. And so, and so it is Understandably, you want to see the commitment to that sector in, in, in this work, in, in these laws. And it's the same thing, the same with the, with the for, for profit folks. Um, so, in, in, as political realists, in the, the rewrite of the, the foreign assistance bill that we were working on in the last Congress with the, with the Democratic chair of the, of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, we were taking very much an incrementalist approach in this change. So, so it was not all of a sudden you changed from sectoral funding to country funding, but but you moved a, in percentages, a, you know, o over the over the years from one to another. Um, and because we work, you know, in coalition with the world visions of the, of, of the world. Um, you know, we hear we, we hear those arguments as we go, and so um, a, as we have in several other um, uh, development issues or relief issues, you know, you, you, you take a, a, a compromise approach. We had we had a bill um, which spread through the world, and a number of our partners really helped to write in the last Congress that if the Congress had not turned over this time. I think we could have, we could have moved through this Congress. Um, I, I think we were that close. And, and to be honest with you, when we cho chose this offering of letters for 2011, we didn't know which way the Congress was going to go. So on one hand, we said, if, if it remains in the way it is now, we can push through this, this major piece of legislation. If it changes as it did, we were going to be able to push through smaller pieces of legislation 
particularly legislation that's focused on um, transparency and accountability, because those are those are things that apply in this Congress. And so we've narrowed our scope somewhat to get that much that much change taken care of in this Congress. Any last questions before we? All right. Well, you join me in thanking then Jerry. On um, June 11th through the 14th, the rest of the world does uh, its, its national gathering in D.C. Um, we bring together several hundred folks for worship and study and um, inspiring speakers, and then we all go to the Hill on a lobby day. Um, and this year, um, we're going to have a, a special emphasis uh, for one day on maternal and child nutrition with 100 experts coming from around the world. That's a sick one. That's a sectoral approach. <laughs> no, actually, it isn't a sectoral approach because it's not separate from um, And um, we would love you to come. So I, I brought brochures for all of you. Um, there was good scholarship for it. The deadline was last Friday. Um, but um, I have a sense that that deadline might be uh, extended. So if you're at all interested, I would encourage you to go ahead uh, to the web and do a uh, do an application for, for a scholarship for it. It's four great days in Washington, and uh, love to have you there. Lobby days. Uh, you can just come to lobby day, though, right? The lobby day is the Tuesday, the 14th. You can just come down to the lobby day as well. And is there a comp for that one? Nah. I don't think. I just said it's free. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> lobby days where you actually get to meet with, um, meet with your uh, congressional office. So that's really cool. We are graduation family is a